Okay, so uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining the quarterly live peer project update community call. I'm Doug Pekanix, uh, the one of the founders and uh, founders of the project and CEO of Live Peer Inc. We do these uh, do these calls once uh, once a quarter. We do a quarterly project update. Once a quarter, we do an orchestrator focused call, and once a quarter, we do um, a call which is um, kind of focused on a hot topic going on in the, the live peer ecosystem. So this is the quarterly project update. Um, it's typically an opportunity for like the core team and the live peer Inc team to share a bunch of updates out to the community. It can certainly be interactive and we can have Q&A and we can have, ask questions, but I know a lot of community members have, have indicated they sort of appreciate the update cadence of these calls. And then we have a lot of like active weekly dialogue in the Discord chat and on weekly water coolers and working group chats and, and everything. So um, yeah, I've got a, a screen share up, but I, I think I should see chat notifications if anyone has questions and drops them into the chat or feel free to um, jump in and, and interrupt and ask questions or share updates as we go. Uh, lastly, just noting this call is being live streamed on livepeer.org slash TV. And it's also being recorded and we'll um, upload it to our our YouTube channel, but also to LensTube and some of the uh, decentralized social uh, video applications that are built on LivePeer. So I know if you participate, you're being being recorded, and this will be shared uh, later and accessible by the uh, by the community. Cool. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to give sort of the quarterly kickoff and project update. Um, Eric Tang, my co-founder, is going to join and talk about user adoption and, and product. And Shannon Wells, who heads up ecosystem growth, is going to give um, some updates on ecosystem and some of the events around the uh, the wider Web3 and, and video ecosystem um, that have been going on lately. Cool. So highlighting kind of where LivePeer is, what's, what's going on. Um, you know, this has been a common message for, um, you know, the last, uh, you know, nine to 12 months really leaning in as, as live peer as the leading on-chain video platform or the leading um, sort of web three blockchain connected video platform. Um, live peer has uses and value propositions to the entire kind of video um, market as a cost-effective transcoding network and a cost-effective streaming and on-demand video infrastructure, but where live peer really um, kind of differentiates itself from the market and has a unique position is in our kind of the blockchain connected nature of our feature set and the fact that our network is decentralized and operated by node operators all around the world. And we believe that the kind of future of media, the future of social media, um, the future of the creator economy will be built on top of these sort of blockchain connected primitives because they're so much better for creators and monetization and content authenticity and whatnot than, than what you see in sort of the um, traditional social and, and infrastructure platforms. And so if that's where the future of uh, you know, the, these industries is going and LivePeer is the leading video infrastructure platform to enable all of those experiences and you believe LivePeer will be uh, or you believe video will be a big part of it, um, which all the, the data and people's experience show it will be, then live here is really well positioned to, um, to capture that opportunity. Um, so this is manifested um, kind of across some of the categories of what I highlight here on this slide. Um, it's manifested in sort of presence within this industry and thought leadership when it comes to events and really convening the conversation around the future of social media and the creator economy. Um, the kind of graphic on the top left here is the invite for the building the new creator economy event that was hosted in Denver at a big ecosystem gathering called ETH Denver, along with great partners, uh, Bundler, Polygon, which are also leading builder platforms in the space, um, super well attended, long wait list, hundreds of attendees, um, tons of applications, our users, our partners, creators, um, and a lot of great ideas exchange about what the future of the space may look like, how video plays a role um, and how live peer can play a role. Um, and you know, a lot of that has occurred in the last quarter. So we did this event in Denver. We just did this event in, in Tokyo. Um, you may hear some more updates from that on, on Shannon. And uh, you know, we participate in a lot of online versions of these events on through Twitter spaces and collaborations with partners. Uh, you know, you'll actually see 
um, specific partnerships that manifest that combine technologies in the space because builders of the future of video, the future of media, creator economy, don't just need video transcoding or live streaming. They actually need to pair that with things like file storage and access control and smart contract logic. And so um, you've seen sort of partnerships and tech compositions between you know, LivePeer and Filecoin with the launch of their FBM virtual machine. Um, live here in the storage network for cost-effective storage and video streaming um, and encoding integrations between live peer and RE for fast video playback, um, integrations between live peer and lit protocol for um, access control. I may hear about some more applications there. Um, and so that's been another big successful theme uh, for live peer in the quarter is just being tightly integrated with the, all the technologies that developers are building on. Um, lastly, on the right, um, you see a list of uh, apps that are, are built with live peer that have sort of publicly come out and, and shared that and admitted that themselves. Um, and, you know, 90% of the apps on this list are blockchain connected or have some on-chain centric component. And that's where you see app developers coming to us. And that's where you see a lot of fast growth. So um, this is available at the new awesome live peer page, uh, which is one of the things we shipped uh, in the, the last quarter. Um, cool. Highlighting some of the key releases, um, Eric may speak more to this on the product side, but a real key one is sort of token gating for on-chain access controls to video uh, is a, a feature that just went live and is well documented in our docs as an enabling a lot of like innovative experiences. Um, the awesome live peer ecosystem showcase launched. It's literally just a GitHub page that lists all of the projects building on live peer, tools built on live peer, tutorials and demo applications and sample apps that developers can reference built on live peer. Um, it's on GitHub, just Google awesome live peer, go to live peer's GitHub page and you'll see it there. And please add anything that uh, exists in the ecosystem that you think is a great showcase or is useful. Um, this will grow over time. And it's, uh, it's you know just really important to show all of the the um, kind of innovations that are being built uh, that relate to the you know the future of on-chain video. Um, Live Peer Network has become a lot more reliable when it comes to video on demand um, transcoding and, and video uploads in particular. This is a product that launched at the very end of sort of last quarter, maybe the very beginning of, of Q1. And it's it's come a long way in terms of becoming more reliable in using the live peer network for the transcoding for the majority of uh, videos that are uploaded through the, the live peer studio gateway. Um, so, um, you know, we'll look at the, the numbers and where, um, you know, numbers are down, numbers are up, but one area where numbers are definitely up is in terms of adoption of this video on demand product and the number of video uploads um, that have been coming uh, through, through that product as well. Um, Last thing I just wanted to highlight that I think is kind of exciting is um, there's an integration between storage and live peer. Storage is like a storage and content delivery um, decentralized uh, product. And it's integrated with live peer for transcoding and video specific capabilities. And there's this really nice screenshot that was shared by one of the users of this combined platform that showed that as soon as they added this integration to their application, uh, they saw a 60% reduction in the bandwidth um, after LivePeer got involved in transcoding video content to make it more um, kind of lightweight for delivery to users. And that's a huge reduction because content delivery is a huge cost for these applications. Um, it can be 80, 90% of the infrastructure cost if you have a scalable application and are delivering video to a lot of users. And so if you can get a 60% savings on that, by integrating live peer, that's um, really powerful and meaningful to a whole bunch of, of users. And that's a great kind of example of one of the successful things that I think this ecosystem should, this project should, should market and show off as we look at uh, demand generation. Cool, um, one thing, you know, some of that is what we've shipped and what's gone well. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is just noting, you know, macro market conditions have been tough for the entire economy for many industries, for the technology industry specifically, and for the you know, crypto connected technology industry, um, even more so in many ways due to, due to some of the, the challenges and high profile um, catastrophes that have occurred in the space in the, you know, the past year, but even continued into this, this quarter. Um, so I want to acknowledge that and be aware of it and just give everyone an update that um, 
you know, Live Peer Inc. is aware of this um, as kind of one of the core developers in the space that has a lot of funding to kind of ensure core protocol development continues. Um, you know, we've taken measures this quarter to ensure that uh, Live Peer Inc. has multiple years of runway to continue to fund and operate. Um, you know, the products we operate and, and be a core source of development for this ecosystem. It's a question that comes up all the time is how market conditions affect any startup, but particularly, uh, you know, I know that live peer ecosystem stakeholders would be concerned about live peer Inc. Um, as mentioned, not to get into too many details, but um, took some steps this quarter to ensure that there are multiple years of, of core development runway and, uh, the, you know, core team is not going anywhere. Um, is, you know, committed and as excited about this this project as ever. And so um, just wanted to to say a couple of words on that. Um, I think, you know, as part of that process, there's been some positive decentralization benefits. Um, there's a kind of independent company called Optimist, which is core developers of the Mist software, um, which is a great kind of video media server that's integrated with LivePeer, um, you know, as its own entity. And uh, there's even a new startup, which maybe you'll hear about in future calls that's focused on interactive uh, video and that's you know connected with these live peer technologies and has a really exciting vision for the future of uh, kind of more interactive video experiences for creators, which is which is exciting um, that kind of emerged from from the live peer core team. Um, so you know excited to share share that. Um, the whole you know point behind it, ensuring we have the capital and runway is just to you know maintain and grow live peer's position as the leading web three video infrastructure and that to ensure that the project is strong and here and has the right products and capabilities and features as there are breakout moments and breakout applications and as market conditions sort of uh, change to be more more favorable. So trying to be good uh, you know stewards of of capital, good shepherds of the project, and uh, put live peer in the best position to you know, be the, the breakout video provider as the sort of on-chain connected video market delivers big impact to the world. Cool, um, yeah, some, some project updates, looking at the metrics. Uh, I think in the, um, you know, when we look at the metrics, when we look at the network stats, the usage stats, it's been really nice that for the last, you know, six to eight quarters, the last two years, we've kind of seen consistent growth in terms of the many of the metrics on the network, but also the, the streaming and usage and demand side metrics in terms of usage, um, you know, to be candid due to kind of market conditions, seasonality, drop in usage of some of our bigger live stream users. This is one of the first quarters where you're not going to see um, all the numbers go up. Um, you know, it's okay. That happens. Um, we'll talk about what is working, what's, what's uh, you know, challenging, but, um, you know, candidly, I think this was a, a tougher quarter for the core metrics. Uh, so yeah, on the network delegator accounts, um, you know, pretty flat down, down 68. It's a very small percentage. Sometimes it's up a little down a little, um, still over 4,000, uh, token holding delegator accounts on the network, um, continue with hundred active orchestrators, which is the, the kind of max size of the set is capped by a community parameter. Um, the, Participation rate, that's the amount of stake or tokens that are staked on the network and participating versus not. Actually had a pretty big drop this quarter, um, you know, dropped from above 50%, which is the equilibrium of mark down to 43.4%. Uh, there's a little bit of a double-edged sword. We're certainly trying to incentivize participation um, and want about 50% of the network um, contributing. When this rate is lower, the rewards are split amongst a, a smaller, number of people in pool of tokens. So rewards are actually up for, for operators. I'll kind of highlight that number on the next slide. Um, so this, you know, this, this last number, the 6,755 LPT that are kind of mintable each round every 21 hours are uh, split between a smaller group right now. So sort of rewards are up for, for all those who are actively operating on the network. Um, highlighting what that looks like, um, sort of the red circle on this this chart that shows a um, you know forty three percent participation rate with the current inflation rate, which swings up a little bit every day that we're um, below fifty percent participation, leads to about a twenty three point four four five percent kind of annualized yield on staked token right now, um, kind of given no no reward cut, and that's a kind of much higher number than it was last quarter when I think it was around sixteen seventeen. 
percent. So, um, you know, hopefully that's a, a nice incentive to stake and participate and run nodes on the uh, on the network, um, just from the inflationary LPT tokens, which helps sort of bootstrap the uh, supply side coming on board. Um, you know, fees continue to be, you know, they're down a little bit this quarter. We'll look at that number, but continue to be, um, you know, in this six, 7,000 uh, kind of USD worth of ETH paid out per week to, to node operators as well, which is an additional additional incentive. Cool, looking at some of the um, demand side usage numbers, um, kind of minutes of video streamed on the network has always been a core KPI. And you see that this quarter, there was actually a pretty big drop from last quarter, a 23% drop, which takes us about flat to where um, the network was nine months ago, 12 months ago. Uh, there's a couple core reasons here. One, I mentioned seasonality and drop a, drop in usage of the apps of some of the bigger live streaming customers. So that's a little outside of live peers control specifically, um, but we, we feel the effects downstream. Um, the other just has to do with some of the input into this bigger Q4 number was as the video on demand capabilities were being developed and tested, there was a lot of testing going on, debugging, troubleshooting, testing out all these features, a lot of test streams and we're not paying in to use this network as this feature is being developed. As this went live, actually a lot of the user's usage kind of went up, but some of that testing um, came back came back down um, to earth, if you will, and uh, was another input here. So um, again, certainly working to uh, to increase this number over time, but uh, you know one of the one of the down metrics this quarter. Um, that leads to a corresponding drop in the quarterly fee revenue for node operators. So this is the US dollar value of the ETH, which was paid out to node operators for doing transcoding on the live peer network. Um, just like the usage was down, what was it, 23%, the, the fees uh, paid out were down about that same percentage, um, down to 90K in, uh, in USD. Uh, hopefully to help offset that, the amount of LPT, which was issued out to token holders and delegators um, rose quite a bit. It rose, um, you know, 7% this quarter to 576,000 LPT. You can do the math based on the variable price of LPT, what that's what that's worth in dollars. Um, but again, that is a, a good offsetting mechanism for the potential lack in uh, ETH revenue through, through fees. Cool. Um, looking at ahead over the next three months, um, I think there's highlighting some of the top priorities. And again, Eric may speak a little bit more about this on the point one, the uh, the product side. Some exciting kind of demand side product launches. Latency reduction on video, live video streams is a big one. That's been a blocker for some apps switching over from um, Amazon or other services to live peer. Um, Multi-user live streams, so allowing to create like an Instagram live type experience where you bring multiple users in a low latency conversation onto the stage, but then streaming that out to many users. Um, and then working towards WebRTC tools, which is again, this, this sort of real-time communication chat, like um, experience in the live peer ecosystem and live peer tool chain and stack um, is another um, sort of powerful area. So stand by for more updates on this coming, you know, even by the, the end of the month and early into next month. Um, I, Something I'm really excited about, I'm spending a lot of my time on and driving, and I have a quick update on the next slide, is around um, thinking about how we can increase public goods funding to apps built on live peer, orchestrators who contribute contributions to the, the community or just even run uh, successful uh, orchestrator tools and, and nodes um, and incentivizing a video builder community um, is important. And then how we make sure that decisions around that are decentralized and the community and stakeholders can shepherd that funding towards what, where they see value um, is the, the way we wanna go about it. And so I actually have a, we'll have a pre-proposal coming out soon for introducing a, a treasury and governance over that treasury um, into live peer for the, the first time. So it'll be sort of the first public goods funding mechanism beyond inflation funding direct to grants nodes. And we'll see, you know, we'll see what the community likes about that, doesn't like about it, how it evolves and how it actually comes to a proposal to, to vote on and go live, but it's um, something I'm excited about. Um, and then, yeah, top priority three um, is something that's been consistent. It's been sort of driving the, the BD and ecosystem development approach is 
how do we make sure that live peer is powering the breakout applications um, in this, this on-chain Web3 video space and just increasing the likelihood that breakout Web3 social and creator-centric applications are leveraging live peer um, and that are using video to, to enable those breakout capabilities. Um, and that's been a, you know, sort of an ink-centric update. It's been sort of the, the strategy and the driver of how Live Peer Inc. thinks about customer development, business development, working with users, um, and everything that remains a, a top priority. Cool. Uh, I think this is the last slide for me, but I just wanted to give a little more insight into this um, this this Live Peer Treasury pre proposal. And this will be a big discussion topic in what are cooler chats and community calls and uh, kind of open office hours calls in the coming months, I think. But uh, like I said, I'm interested to propose a community-governed treasury for public goods funding in LivePeer. Um, you know, what I'm going to propose is a sort of two-tiered system where, you know, LivePeer's existing governance can be used to allocate funds from a treasury to maybe specific entities like DAOs or committees that form who can be kind of um, more thoughtful, apply more expertise, be more judicious in how those entities then route funds to specific recipients. Um, I think, you know, one of these entities, for example, could be the existing grants committee and maybe an expansion of that grants committee. And I think that's really powerful for proactive funding or, or getting funding in advance to things who need that funding in order to build. And then I think, you know, our orchestrator committee community it can be a really good kind of entity that can think more about like retroactive rewards for those who have made great contributions to the supply side of the network, the tooling, the orchestrator nodes and tools. Um, and can, you know, they can be more judicious about allocating funding to that group than say every, you know, token holder based on stake. And then I think the video builder community is a, a really important one. It's something we haven't succeeded at incentivizing in live peer because um, there's no protocol mechanism to get tokens in the hands of video builders. But I think that community can be really powerful in solving that problem and making video innovators, video builders, applications built on live peer stakeholders in this project, having them participate in the community, participate in the innovations going, going forward. Um, and so excited to propose mechanisms for, for that as well. So huge topic here. We can save a lot of the details for, for future calls, but I wanted to preview that as a big focus in the, uh, the coming couple of months. Cool, uh, that, uh, that kind of concludes my, my project update before I kick it over to, uh, to Eric and Shannon. Um, any questions that people wanna ask or surface? Yeah, okay. So as usual, these community calls are a little bit more broadcast, but you know where to find me in the, uh, the live peer discord um, and the forum. And like I said, uh, lots of discussions to come on these, uh, on these topics. Um, cool, so switching over to a, a user and product update. Is Eric here on the call? I know he had another call he was on was gonna join at some point. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Cool, do you want me to flip through these slides or do you wanna take, take control? I can do it. I'll, okay, uh, let me stop sharing. Okay, so I'll just continue to share this. Um, yeah, share this screen. Uh, sorry, one second. Okay, um, for a user and product update, um, just quickly, um, you know, Doug already mentioned this a little bit. Uh, we, in the last quarter, launched this, you know, video on demand capability in uh, in Live Peer, which was quite a, a undertaking, right? So, you know, it's it's a kind of a core video feature that you know Live Peer has always wanted to to you know implement, and you know, we've we've talked about it forever, even. In the very early days of live peer, we, you know, we were making a decision of whether to do video on demand first or live streaming first, right? So, so it's good to good to see that you know video on demand finally become 
um, a core tenant of the the life peer you know network and also the core life peer open open source software and the service itself kind of in this in this whole stack right so uh, for those who are who are not as familiar for uh, to like video on demand what that means it's um it, it's you know allowing someone to upload a recorded video uh, and be able to stream it to uh, to an audience right so that re that requires um ingesting the video segmenting it transcoding it um uh, caching it around the world streaming it uh, through different methods like using a cdn uh or um, and, and also kind of playing them back in the video player uh tracking the metrics uh and, and the um, viewer accounts and the engagement engagement data right so all of those little components are are like very important for this whole experience to work well uh and we've really spent time to to build out each each one of them uh and and as how that uh, impact on the supply side um we you know there um you know the 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 supply side of the network that that's transcoding uh or getting those jobs right there um you know as as people upload the videos this video gets segmented and sent to the live network to get transcoded and then and then sent back um so i think what uh what went well is you know those jobs are being distributed and and they're on the network now um we we're still working on kind of the fast verification of those uh video on demand jobs right um so so that's something that I think we kind of tested for a little bit launched uh realized there were some other issues and kind of rolled back on the fast verification mechanism itself um but we're well you know now we're kind of doing a second round of testing and and we'll be we'll be rolling rolling this out to the network uh shortly um some um yeah so I think some lessons learned there is you know we we definitely can do a better job more thoroughly testing all the different corner cases uh, before we before we really put something uh, into production, right? So the, this fast verification thing uh, is um, is an example of that, and you know we'll be we'll be kind of launching newer version of Go Live Peer, so the orchestrators uh, in the network will be able to upgrade and, and kind of participate in that fast verification uh, mechanism. Um, so so talking about kind of the 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 features um you know some of the some of the core features that became available in in q1 right we you know video on demand um kind of in, in enables a bunch of new things right because you know the way that we that we do video on demand in live here is not just the traditional um you know uploading and, and streaming the video but also it's a it's a very blockchain centric and web3 centric view of that so so one of the capabilities is uh being able to upload the video uh into live here um or being able to upload video files from IPFS and Arweave which you know are kind of the preeminent uh decentralized storage uh solutions um using um using live here to automatically transcode and cache uh the video around the world um and get it get it to be ready for a global playback uh but at the same time uh, because it's because the source of video file is stored in IPFS and Arweave uh, you can also uh, very easily use that to mint a video NFT, uh, and and this is a pretty interesting feature because um, it uh, when you mint an uh, NFT using this feature in Live Peer, it kind of preserves the mapping between the IPFS hash and the video playback URL inside Live Peer, so that um, you can still continue to mint the NFT using the IPFS hash, but you're able to play back the video now using the live peer playback URL, right? So, and, and, the, and because the live peer URL is optimized for a global playback, right? That actually just creates a lot more capability for these video-based NFTs, uh, both from a, you know, the um, allowing much bigger resolution for the video asset for these NFTs, but also, you know, longer content, um, you know, longer content length, right? Um, and so, so this is a great uh, feature and use case for some of these Web3 social and creator applications, because, um, you know, while, for example, inside the Lens ecosystem, um, you know, there there are some um, these there are some example applications that are already using Live Peer. In fact, uh, many of the biggest applications in the Lens ecosystem are kind of powered by Live Peer now uh, as for their video features. Uh, on the left, we have LensTube. That's kind of the the leading video um, application in the Lens ecosystem. Um, and on the right uh, is Orb, which is you know, the fastest growing uh, mobile application in the Lens ecosystem. Um, 
and, and inside Lens, uh, when you create a video post, um, each of those posts actually is a video NFT under the hood, right? So, so that really kind of just take advantage of, of this, um, you know, decentralized storage feature that I just talked about. Um, moving forward, we, we just recently launched um, the access control and token gating, right? So, so what this means is you're able to, you know, upload video files into a live peer and specify um, and limit the access to a specific audience. Uh, and and it's compatible with uh, some of some of the existing access control um, solutions like Lit Protocol or Guild.xyz or or Collabland, which is uh, really popular among kind of Web three Discord um, Discord servers. You know, I think Collabland has you know over forty five thousand Discord servers using them. You know, millions and millions of users. Um, and and because of this, um, use. Um, that users of these applications are able to upload video and do token gating, right? So using um, the the token ownership, NFT ownership as gating mechanisms, um, and and this is a really good tool to create for for communities to create exclusive content for their members, right? As these NFT projects move beyond um, you know the PFP phase and and start to really think about how to make these projects. Uh, maintain sustainable in the long term. Uh, a lot of it is going to be around creating uh, more value for the NFT holders for these Web3 communities uh, and being able to create exclusive video content um, is going to be a very important, um, very important capability for them. So we're we're very excited about this feature. Um, there are some some examples here. Um, there's a um, NFT project called Stoner Cats, uh, which is a um, kind of an animated series uh, created by Ashton Kutcher and and Mila Kunis and and Snoop Dogg, and um, in, in they they use Live Peer to do exactly that token gating, right? In fact, they do uh, what's called a, a perpetual, perpetually token gated uh, video content. Uh, what that means is uh, the video is first encrypted, written into IPFS, and then it's shared into LivePeer, uh, and that decryption key is shared into Live into LivePeer network, so that the, the LivePeer network can decrypt the video, transcode it, cache it around the world. Uh, but also, uh, it uses LivePeer for gating access to these animated series based on the ownership of the Stoner Cats NFT. Right. So, pe uh, so people with the Stoner Cats, uh, people with ownership of the Stone Cat Stoner Cats NFTs are the only people who can actually access the animated series uh, to stream it, but they cannot get access to the source video inside IPFS because you know that source video is encrypted using a different key, right? And this is a, a pretty critical component for, for all of these things to work. Um, a, a second example is, is Bonfire. Uh, here we have um, on the right, uh, Bonfire is a, a creator application that kind of helps um, you know, any any content creators to move into Web3. They have this really uh, seamless creator onboarding experience uh, that allows creators to kind of take their existing Web2 audience with them. Uh, so, you know, the gating mechanism is not just based on NFT ownership or token ownership, but can also be things like, you know, followership on Twitter or any any kind of custom custom logic. And, and, and Barnfire um, kind of leveraged live peer to do this. Uh, token gating mechanism inside the application. Um, we, you know, Doug also mentioned this third feature a little bit, uh, transcoding, purity transcoding API, right? So um, this feature, um, the, the workflow is easy. If you have video, video files stored somewhere, uh, you can use this API to transcode that existing video and then output the transcoding results into a custom uh, storage solution for then streaming from that location later, right? So uh, this this transcoding API now is compatible with Web3 storage, which is kind of the uh, the leading uh, storage product inside the IPFS and Filecoin ecosystem, uh, and also with storage, which is another um, uh, another decentralized um, storage protocol. Um, and, and it's great for kind of video applications that are really looking to save transcoding cost and bandwidth cost. Uh, here we have a couple of examples. Uh, on the left, uh, there's a nonprofit called God Behind Bars, uh, which is a video streaming, kind of mission-based video streaming um, uh, application that uh, 
streams sermons um, to inmates that are um, that are in prison, right? Uh, and for a nonprofit like that, uh, the cost of video streaming is really really important, right? So they really need to find a cost-effective solution. Uh, and and by shifting over to live peer, they're able to serve. Uh, they're they're able to serve, save a ton of of uh, streaming cost. Uh, on the right, uh, we have Tribe Social, uh, which is a kind of a um, an, uh, you know a niche online communities tool. Um, and you know and, and this tool kind of uh, specializes in a kind of this decentralized value proposition, giving a hundred percent of the ownership to the communities that are um, organized around. Um, uh, uh, that, that are using these, this tool, right? So they use uh, a combination of live here for transcoding and storage for streaming, uh, for storing the video and streaming the video. And with the with the combination, they're able to save their cost by by almost 10x. Um, the last thing I want to mention here is um, it's a little bit uh, forward looking um, in terms of feature development. Um, Where you know in in this last quarter, we've really started to make a lot of um, leap in terms of the, our thinking around what's what's interesting and disruptive at the intersection of video streaming and blockchain, uh, not just from the infrastructure perspective, but really from a application development and user experience perspective, right? So, uh, so kind of that next step of how that really is going to impact the end user. Um, we, we've been doing a series of internal workshops uh, first to kind of flush these ideas out. Um, there was an internal group called the kind of the Life Peer API working group. Uh, and this working group started doing experiments of building, the, like really building in public and sharing ideas out um, as much as possible. Uh, start, they started doing biweekly calls in Discord uh, that anybody can attend. Um, and we really wanted, we, we really want to kind of extend the invitation to everybody on this call and to everybody who is going to be watching this. Uh, later on, uh, that to to come and and join this group discussion and talk about kind of the future of video streaming uh, in Web three. Uh, we we're talking about interesting concepts like uh, API design that's Web three centric, signing of videos, different delegated uh, signing mechanisms, uh, talking about content authenticity and content provenance, right? So all of these things that are going to be uh, it, um, very important in the in the pretty short term, we think, given the kind of the proliferation of generative AI, uh, given the the rise of decentralized social applications. Um, you know, this is kind of at the forefront of of you know the really disruptive ideas. So yeah, come come and join us uh, in the discussion. Uh, I think that's it. That's it for me. Um, if people have questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll, I'll yield the floor for uh, to Shannon. Thanks, Eric. Hey, everyone, just gonna get my screen going here. Uh, uh, um. Ooh. Sorry. I don't know why my screen share is not working. Okay, great. Can everyone see this? Ooh. Okay. Cool. Ecosystem update. What is kind of driving uh, the the strategy and and stuff we do around growing the life here ecosystem right now? It's really about um, taking a bet on the creator economy and the Web3 creator economy uh, in particular being the thesis where we're gonna see breakout applications um, around video. And so the creator economy, um, you know, last year was valued at around 100 billion US. Uh, the YouTube creator ecosystem alone contributed more than 20 billion to that, but the pie is not evenly split and we know a lot of the reasons why why that is because the dominant platforms YouTube, Twitch, um, also have a monopoly on the infrastructure that powers those front end applications, and that's what allows uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon to take a huge creator take rate um, from people who put video content 
uh, online. YouTube takes about 50 to 60 cents on every dollar uh, that a creator makes. Twitch has been, you know, increasing its creator take rate. Uh, and yeah, there are very few people who are able to earn a living in the existing kind of digital economy model because of because of those dynamics. And um, you know, more than a quarter or less than a thousand dollars a year, if you you know can eventually get to a sustainable source of income by um, being a digital creator, it will take you, you know, a year to two years um, to be able to do that. So, you know, a lot of when we, when when I and, and Eric and others on the team are out, you know, speaking in the market around life here's value proposition, it's really, you know, the the cost disruption that we offer in terms of, you know, 10x cheaper uh, video services because we have decentralized compute. That's that's obviously like a really strong. Um, and compelling reason for an application developer to want to use live peer because their infrastructure costs are lower. They don't have to take such a high take rate. But in addition, when you pair, you know, those low infrastructure costs with other Web3 primitives that allow users and creators to own and monetize their content, that's where we really think we're going to see uh, breakout applications. So we are really trying to be at the forefront of this conversation, as Doug mentioned earlier, like really convening, um, convening the market, convening the leading technology projects, thought leaders and creators in this space to really try and identify what are the opportunities for new applications um, to come about. So uh, all, this year we've done three, you know, creator economy themed events in, in different parts um, around the world really now. Um, the first one was back in January. We hosted um, a evening design jam with uh, the founder of C Club, which is the largest uh, Web3 DAO accelerator, Refraction, which is a um, Web3 cultural initiative and Fission, which is actually part of the Protocol Labs ecosystem that's developing some really interesting technology around account abstraction uh, and you can solutions that um, really make it easy for developers to provide trustless solutions to creators who don't necessarily care about all of the back end weeds of decentralized infrastructure. So a really interesting group um, came together for that. We also, again, as Doug mentioned, did um, a day-long summit in partnership with ETH Denver. Um, in Denver, we had an amazing turnout for that, uh, had Polygon and Bundler, who are in the Bundlers in the RV ecosystem, as partners for that. And I just created some slides on what the content for that looked like. We had an opening conversation with Adam Levy, who for the last two years has been um, hosting an amazing podcast on the Web3 creator economy called Mint. If, if you guys haven't seen it, I definitely encourage you to check out that podcast. He's also the co-founder of Bello, which is a new um, Web3 creator data tool um, that provides a lot of insights into what's happening into the creator economy. So really dove into um, what the creator economy means. And all of the content is actually posted online and we'll make sure that um, you know the links, you guys have the links so that we can probably post it in the Discord um, afterwards to make sure you can review all of this content. We had Nader Dabit, who's obviously like one of the most prolific, prominent, um, you know, developer relations leaders in the space, as well as um, Steph Orpilla, who leads developer relations at Polygon Labs. And, and she gave an amazing presentation on um, the creator applications that she's seen in, in the Polygon ecosystem. And I would say Polygon, because of the, you know, low transaction cost has really been leading the development of Web3 social applications, you know, lenses in the Polygon Labs ecosystem. Um, and she talked a lot about the application she would like to see in the future as well. Uh, we had a talk on a panel on Web3 tech for Web3 creators. So really looking at the foundational technology that's enabling um, you know, the new creator economy. Eric was on, on the panel. We had Bundler, Lit, uh, and the head of protocol engineering at Zora, as well as um, LDF, the head of partnerships at, at Disco, which is a, a digital identity um, solution. We had, um, whoop, okay. There were the other, yeah, the, the other panels we had um, at that event in Denver were, um, creator tools. So projects like Bonfire, which Eric's referred to, 
um, lens, uh, projects that are really like trying to make it as easy as possible for people to create content. We also had a session on the future of media brands and really looking at what DAOs and you know Web3 communities mean for the creation and ownership of content, opportunities for new advertising models. Um, and then we took the show on the road to Japan, where I, I just returned from on, on Monday. And, you know, one of the reasons why we went to Japan was actually realizing that there is a self-organized live peer community um, in Japan. There are a couple of projects that are actually using live peer. Um, and one of those projects has an ambassador who's uh, created a live peer Discord server. If you guys haven't joined the live peer Japan um, Discord, please go in. There are people speaking in, in English. Um, and, and that community really self-organized for us for this event, um, found a venue for us to be able to host another one of these meetups. And we actually, yeah, had had builders from the Japan ecosystem present. We also had, we were really lucky to have as a partner for this event, Flow Blockchain. Um, we had the co-founder, uh, Dieter Shirley, who's also the co-founder of Dapper Labs and CryptoKitties. And, and, and Dieter is actually credited with creating the ER721 NFT standard. So I had a really interesting talk from him. We had another panel with great partners from Protocol Labs, Lit, um, as well as Superfluid. And yeah, really great lightning talks. Um, and these are all, these are all, except for Kimo from Orb, who came from San Francisco, the other three, Shugo, Yuki, and, and Mono, are uh, projects based in Japan that are using live peer um, uh, to do live streaming, to do social metaverse applications. So it was really exciting to hear from them. And then of course we sponsored the ETH Global, ETH Tokyo hackathon, which was really incredible. We had over 12 projects build with live peer. We came in at a, at a lower sponsorship level. We didn't have a booth, but we still had an amazing turnout um, in terms of builders. And I think it's because we already have you know, a community and, and had a lot of awareness going in to the hackathon. And the focus um, for this hackathon and the ones that we're going to be doing um, in the near term is really about uh, testing the token gating tool and just seeing what kind of experiments um, builders can take uh, with the tool. And it was really interesting to see the creativity in terms of access control logics that people can use with our token gating tool. Um, it, you know, as long as you're using uh, the access control API, it's really up to the builder to decide what solution they, they want to use, whether that's, you know, an existing protocol like Lit or Unlock or Collabland. Um, really interesting hacks using zero-knowledge proofs. Um, ZK Snarks is also as well as uh, ZK Badges with a project called Sysmo, which is a ZK project. Um, really interesting use of Superfluid, which is a payment streaming protocol um, to token gate uh, based on subscriptions using Superfluid. Um, so there's a tweet thread that went out, I think yesterday or the day before that actually summarized all, all of the projects um, and include links to those, those projects as well. So you can you can see them and just at a, at a high level in terms of that hackathon and, and, and being there, um, ETH Global, which is you know the, the kind of primary platform for onboarding builders into the Web3 ecosystem, the Ethereum ecosystem, and certainly I think the largest hackathon organizer like generally in Web3, this was one of their largest ever events. They had done a lot of, you know, scouting and researching in Asia to figure out where it would make sense to do a hackathon. And, and you know, they determined that there's the most Web3 development happening in, in, in Japan. And I certainly saw that. Um, the general themes for the hackathon were around zero knowledge, account abstraction, um, as well as AI. And the overall quality of, of the hackathons was really amazing. So definitely encourage you all to see, to look at the showcase from, from the hackathon. Um, and then, yeah, just like kind of an overall update on uh, the the activities we have going on in the Web3 Builder community, primarily, yeah, which have been hackathons. We did the Filecoin virtual machine hackathon called Space Warp uh, back in late February and March. Um, and, and, you know, F FBM Filecoin virtual machine really is an, a new kind of endeavor for the Filecoin ecosystem. And, and it's really about programmable storage. So it is a new L1 smart contract layer that sits on top of Filecoin data. And so, you know, I think we're in the early stages of working with the Filecoin and Protocol Labs team to 
to identify what the use case, the video use cases around that can look like. But, you know, one of the things I'm excited about is like the concept of data DAO. So, you know, why would you want to program um, content that exists in decentralized storage? So if you have communities of interest who care about particular, you know, types of content. So, um, you know, particularly around content moderation, you know, trust and safety, you can see, you know, different smart contracts kind of starting to govern the types of content that will and won't be stored. Um, but very early days on this, although we continue to work really closely, um, again, with the Filecoin and IPFS ecosystem as they, you know, really prioritize moving towards that, that new world of development. We did the ETH Global Tokyo Hackathon that I mentioned. Um, we've just started a really exciting hackathon um, run by Aragon, which is the DAO Global Hackathon. And this is gonna be another really cool space to work with folks in the Web3 ecosystem who you know, come from a DAO community um, interest perspective to understand, yeah, how, how token-gated video can help DAOs and communities both monetize their content as well as increase engagement. Um, you know, you have DAOs like um, FWB, Friends with Benefits, that are, you know, starting to create their own community native applications. They want to be able to gate um, content for, the, for their members. So we're really excited to see what's going to happen with that. Um, and then in June, really starting early stages for planning a five-week online hackathon called Next Video Games. So some of you may remember we did the Next Video online hackathon um, at the end of 2022 into, into January. Um, which was a you know generic uh, kind of video web three video hackathon. It was the, the first ever web three video hackathon. The intention with this next next iteration is, is focusing on gaming. Um, and I actually went to the game developers conference GDC in San Francisco last month. And GDC is a conference that's been happening for over twenty years. Um, it's where kind of innovation in the gaming sector happens. And this was the, the first year that Web3 had a really big presence. And I would say it was about um, 40 to 50% of the floor space uh, at GDC, which was really significant. And I think, you know, what that signals is, you know, there's really mainstream acceptance um, of Web3 in gaming. Um, and why that matters for live for video um, and live peer is because streaming and esports uh, are you know really heavy users of video, but also like gamers are usually driving. Pro gamers are really driving a lot of that. You know, Fortnite and Twitch um, kind of developed in tandem. So we're really excited to alongside other Web3 projects that are also really invested in trying to understand. Um, every, everyone's trying to figure out their value proposition for Web3 gaming because so many gamers are moving in to Web3. We're really excited to kind of own and, and drive um, a focused hackathon that can explore what does the future of video in gaming look like. You know, we're trying to work with game designers and gamers who are interested in, you know, building and playing games to be watched. Um, you know, obviously, like playing the games is 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 the primary objective, but what if you could design a game so fun that, you know, you were dividing for the audience, I think for live here, that becomes really interesting. So stay tuned for more info on that. And yeah, this is just a, um, a preview of, of all the amazing partners who've signed up for the Dow Global Hackathon. If you, you know, are a builder and you want to register for that, there's still time. I wanted to give a quick update on grants. Um, I don't know if there's anyone new on the call who doesn't know about the live peer grants program, but it is a sustainable funding mechanism for the live peer ecosystem. It is a node um, that was established by live peers founders, and the inflationary rewards on the node are what is used to um, as revenue for the grants program. Um, and so we made some changes last quarter, and this was after you know looking at almost a year um, of grants programming that we were getting a lot of applications that were you know looking for kind of investor level checks, and you know we don't have a huge treasury, um, and it you know when you're looking for over thirty k. Um, in funding, it's really like a different level of conversation. And so that's part of why we also established the accelerator program was to provide a different kind of support for projects who were at a later stage. We also just noticed that there were a lot of projects that weren't really hitting their milestones, weren't really like 
doing anything super on the demand side. Um, and the, yeah, but the, these comments are really about demand side um, applications as we have seen more of those come in over the last year plus. Um, yeah, there were like a, a lot of just kind of basic integrations of live live peer by, you know, projects that didn't really have a lot of intention to continue growing. So um, with a new grants lead coming in, Hans Yadav, who I think you've probably all seen now in the Discord and in the GitHub where um, the live peer grants program exists, um, we've really been executing on a, a new more scope strategy for demand side um, specific categories. We have a new um, builder micro grants program, which is meant to be kind of a follow on for hackers um, or for projects who do want to focus on a live peer integration. It's a very tightly scoped, um, very tightly scoped grants, $2,000 max. And then we have a new category um, uh, called video disruptors, and that's the largest um, grant that we will offer is 15,000. And that's for projects that are really identifying like compelling new use cases for video in Web3 and that are, you know, not just trying to create clones of a Web2 application, but really want to push the boundaries um, of what new uh, video experiences in Web3 can look like. The first um, recipient we had for that is a, a video AI project that's actually based in the Lens ecosystem that's developing some really interesting creator tooling that makes it easy um, for creators to leverage text to video functionality powered by live peer. So we really like hope to see more uh, projects coming in. Uh, yeah, under that category. And yeah, just note here that we all the grants program also um, distributes uh, hackathon prize payout. So every time we sponsor a hackathon, um, our prize winners actually get paid an LPT, which we think is an important way to put LPT um, in the hands of our builders and give them a stake in the network. And so this is an overview of, uh, for last quarter, the spending by grant type. So you could see hackathon bounties are actually a pretty large um, portion of that. Community contribution is community contributors um, who are paid through the grants node. The Live Peer Open Network grant, um, that's the supply side category. We, we really don't want to put um, any restrictions on, on the supply side orchestrator grants. I think like having observed the program you know, now for a year and a half, it's just incredible, like how the orchestrator community is really able to like identify the problems um, that, you know, um, are public good problems that that need solutions. So we're um, haven't yeah put any restrictions on that category. Um, yeah, we have have started to see uh, you know grants come in under the new categories, uh, micro grant and video disruptors. We also do get some requests for sponsorships. Um, Alvin and our community actually hosted um, an event, a staking event in the Philippines, which we sponsored. Um, as well as the open, the deprecated open grant category is just the um, the pay up, the payouts for previous grant applicants that we had um, already committed to under the previous uh, structure. A quick note on the accelerator program. So we will probably by the end of next month be coming out with um, the second uh, call for. Uh, the call for the second cohort of the accelerator program. We had six projects uh, complete the program, um, you know, a little over almost two months ago now, um, and it was it was really successful. We're going to be making some tweaks in terms of making sure that the projects coming in already have or ha have already started integrating. Um, with live peer, we're also starting to experiment with some uh, streaming credits, similar to you know a lot of Web two infrastructure projects like Amazon have, um, you know infrastructure credits uh, for their projects. It's actually something I'm starting to see coming in in hackathons. ETH Global, actually, interestingly, in Tokyo, just announced that all of the uh, finals for ETH Global will, will receive AWS credits, which was, I thought was a little strange that they're offering Web2 infrastructure credits to Web3 hackers, but whatever. Um, <laughs> we're going to be looking at that mechanism, too, to help grow uh, the ecosystem. And that's it from me. So welcome. And we're a bit over time. Sorry about that. Happy to take any questions. Oh, saw some, sorry. Does Lavier have an incubator? Yes, great. Happy, Lamont, happy to chat more about that. I have a question. <clears throat> How are you guys? Can you hear me? Hey, Pablo. Hey, Pablo. What's up? What's up? What's up? Uh, 
I have a um, quick question. I don't know if it's actually on, on topic, but um, I see you guys are coming out with uh, RTC, maybe. Uh, I think it's planned for uh, to be released like next quarter. How is that? How does that fit into the Life Your Roadmap? And, and what is kind of like the, the use case for that? Was there a lot of people requesting these features? And what is the situation now with like Huddle? I think Huddle also is trying to go into the infrastructure route. How do you guys compare to them? Any thoughts on that? I don't know if this is the right question for this call, but I was interested. Yeah, it's a great question. There's a lot in there. Um, before I jump in and give an overview, would, would Eric or Hunter want to um, give sort of a roadmap update on this? Hunter, do you want to take it? Take a, if you're there. You yeah, yeah, it? sure. Um, I, I can give some some perspective on on the roadmap aspects of that. Um, th there's work in in flight right now um, to, to enable WebRTC. Um, I, I don't have an ETA on what that looks like, um, primarily because there's a bit of SDK level work required to to productize it in a way that's going to be useful and where people don't have to walk through calls to to, to really develop using WebRTC. Um, I mean, in terms of experience and for 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 that feature, the idea would would be to move towards a, a world where we enable uh, in browser or streaming um, um, as well as uh, streaming from from mobile apps uh, without the, the use of you know additional uh, complex SDKs like third party dependencies. Um, so so I'm, not, I'm not sure if that answers your, your question and Pablo, uh, I, th I think the, the answer is sooner rather than later um, and we'll hopefully hopefully be able to provide you with a, a clear date um within the next a couple of weeks yeah and i would add on there um, when it comes to use cases and you asked sort of about huddle and, and versus live peer um what do we hear all the time what do we see all the time with our, our current and prospective users is that they're interested in this sort of hybrid experience where they have um you know a couple people engaging in like a a co-creation experience, whether it's like a meeting or a collaboration where it's a couple participants in a um, in a live stream, but then uh, you know using that to broadcast out uh, to to a much larger audience, and sort of the lack of that real time element has you know caused some of those users to to look elsewhere or meet their requirements via different solutions, um, and I think enabling that sort of capability for video builders first and foremost. Um, becomes interesting as opposed to say, um, you know, conferencing being the primary use case. Um, I think if you're building a, a video conferencing app straight off the bat, uh, there might be some more mature products out there. And I think Huddle's done an awesome job of creating both an application and uh, the beginnings of an infrastructure um, for that. But, you know, certainly under the mission of being the world's open video infrastructure, having all the right incentives and open software to enable you know, all the video use cases. I think real time is clearly an important part of a video and there's no reason that live peer shouldn't have um, access to, to real time features over time. Nice, thank you. Great answers um, and great calls. Well, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I know we're, we're 10 minutes over time. Also, sorry about the mix ups with the um, link to join this call. Not sure what happened there, but I'm glad everyone could join, um, listen to these updates. Definitely look forward to a lot of uh, engaging discussions in the forum, the water coolers, et cetera, or some of this, uh, these exciting topics that we have coming up in the, uh, the next couple of months. So um, I will post this recording to LensTube and, and YouTube. And uh, for those who couldn't join the call, and we can spread it around and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone.